and I'm a collections manager here in ethnology and I specialize in getting information out to people about all the objects here. Uh, we're looking at a collection of six um, antique guns from the Philippines and these actually came into the museum in the 1930s through a, what we call a permanent loan and our registrar was able to find the family that these belonged to. We called them up, they were delighted, they took them away. Uh, we didn't think we'd ever see them again. Six months later, we get a phone call from the family and they want to donate them. So the first step for us is to actually get them properly identified and I called in Arn Sledeback, who works in exhibits here at the museum. And he was able to come in and start giving us information. The more we looked at these, we started to go, oh, I don't think these would fire. And the idea of, well, maybe it's a mock weapon, uh, that we started to look into that, and um, the story unfolds from there. Hi, my name is Arne Sledebach. I work at the Burke Museum and have for many years. I'm familiar with the collections here, and since I have been a little boy, I've been very interested in antique weapons of all kinds. It, it's interesting when we start to look at these guns, uh, we see that some of them look like they might actually fire, and others look like they'd probably explode if we tried to fire them. So uh, we decided that these guns were probably dummy weapons rather than real weapons, and they were meant to uh, convince the enemy, and of course at that time the enemy was the United States, uh, because we're talking about the Philippine-American War, which occurred about 1899 into the early 1900s. Uh, they were trying to convince the Americans that uh, they had real, functional, dangerous weapons here. Hi, my name is Kelly Porter and I'm a graduate student of museology here at the University of Washington and I work in the ethnography department. So a few of these weapons have pretty elaborate um, mock lock mechanisms and this one is meant to imitate a mule ear lock and essentially you'd kind of pop this up here and pull the trigger and you can see on the top that it rests on this little trigger pull and when you pull it it kind of smashes down on this little nipple here. Now if this were a functional gun there would be a hole in that nipple that leads into the breech of the barrel that would have a blasting cap over it and it would actually send a charge in there but if you look at it real close and I don't know if you can see there's no hole in there so there's no way for this weapon to actually deliver a charge. You could use it as a cap gun but that's about it. <laughs> so the other one that has a really interesting sort of um, mock lock mechanism, and this was one that Arne and I puzzled over for a long time, is this one. Um, and it resembles most closely a, a Japanese matchlock rifle, where they would have this uh, sort of snapping arm that would come down, and it would have a burning cord, and it would go into a little flash pan and send that charge into the barrel. And you can see that there's actually a hole that leads into the barrel, but there's no place to put the cord. And we really, we really don't know how this would have worked. I mean, hypothetically, there are some mechanisms there, but it, it really doesn't seem possible that this was functional. So you would prop it up on there and then pull the trigger, and it would come down. One thing to look at is to see if the end of the barrel, the, the breech, is uh, really tightly closed, because you can't have a functioning gun if that area is open. In other words, if you look at a cross section of a barrel, yes, the pen doesn't work too well. <laughs> um, it needs to be tightly closed in the back and there might be a small hole here, there has to be some sort of small hole here so that uh, somehow when you have the powder and the ball uh, you can ignite this charge with a match or some other mechanism. But if it's open in the back as, as some of these are, there's no way that would work because the gases, the hot gases would come out and uh, possibly blind the the person who's using the weapon or trying to. So because all of these guns in order to be functional would need some sort of seal or breech plug, we started looking at these to see if they actually had that feature. And if you look down at this one, you can see on the very end there's a huge gap in the back from where the barrel meets up with this, this backstop here. So this one would have fallen under the realm of definitely not safe to use. <laughs> um, some of the other ones are a little bit harder to tell. Um, like these, we don't really, we can't really tell if this is properly sealed or not. It certainly looks like it could be because it's, you can see that it's firmly fitted in the back there and there's some pretty substantial metal plating around it. But uh, for most of these, it's, it's really pretty hard to tell. Um, 
This one we actually tested with some testing material to see if uh, there was any leak in the back here and it, it showed that basically there wasn't a substantial breech plug. Um, so this one would likely not have been functional. Um, these will become part of the permanent collections of the Burke Museum and we're here to serve a very wide um, audience of researchers and, and artists and craftspeople who come in and study the collections um, to learn about either things they want to make or, or their personal research. And these are a fabulous example of something coming in, we didn't know much about them, okay, they fall under our scope of collections, which is the Pacific Rim, and they turn out to actually have a really fascinating story and a historical connection to the um, Filipino um, wars, and so it makes perfect sense that they're here in our collection, and we're, we're delighted that we will be taking care of these for the future. <laughs>